Okay, so here we go. Sorry about that shaky start. Uh, welcome to this Carbon Co-op webinar, uh, which is on new and emerging approaches to quantifying energy savings for retrofit and uh, other energy saving and energy um, efficiency interventions. Um, just a bit of housekeeping to say, yes, unfortunately, we're not able to use the chat today, but do use the Q&A um, facility to answer or to ask, sorry, questions. Um, myself and James will be making a presentation, and then at the end of that period, you'll be able to ask questions, or you can ask questions throughout, but we'll be able to answer them towards the end. Uh, just to introduce the webinar, um, yeah, we're going to talk about the session and give you a bit of an intro to, to how this came about. We'll talk about the quantification problem and why innovation is needed. We'll talk about creating a counterfactual um, uh, to solve that quantification problem. We'll talk about our particular project, PowerShaper Tracker, or our particular tool. We'll talk about potential uses for this whole approach, not just specifically our tool and uh, a bit of an intro to the policy environment and where things sit at the moment. And then we'll have a chance for questions, hopefully at least 15 minutes. Okay, so just to give you a brief introduction to this um, topic and to this uh, webinar, um, our specific project that Carbon Corp has been running over the last nine months is known as Open Energy Efficiency Savings, Open NFs. And this is a specific um, open technical innovation uh, that was being developed under an Innovate UK program, uh, which I do recommend people check out called Open Digital Solutions to Net Zero Energy. So that's specifically looking at open source, open uh, standards, and other open approaches to you know, tackling net zero and, and all the things we, need, we know we need to do. And, and a fundamental understanding that open uh, approaches will be more effective, quicker to deploy, and uh, hopefully more interoperable than uh, more closed IP ones. It was a nine month project that ends in a couple of days time. And it's seen a collaboration between Carbon Corp and some other stakeholders, including LF Energy and People Powered Retrofit, a one-stop shop for retrofit based here. There's a, a page there you can check out more about the project. And one thing I want to emphasize is this isn't something completely new. It builds on past work done by organizations such as EP Group, uh, Energy Systems Catapult, and the Green Finance Institute. And it is leading on to future work, which will start very, very soon. So it's not something that uh, has come out of nowhere and will finish. It's very much part of an ongoing process. And in terms of presentations, there's myself, Jonathan. I'm Retrofit Lead here at Carbon Co-op. And I've had a particular focus on exploitation and business development. And James, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I'm uh, James Fenner. I joined Carbon Co-op uh, in around July last year, having uh, recently completed uh, a research thesis on meter savings. And uh, yeah, I've been leading the data science and analysis package for um, Carbon Co-op since then. Thank you, James. Um, just very brief progress, uh, sorry, um, a very brief update on context. So Carbon Corp are kind of active in this space. There's a number of things that kind of relevant and feed into this. Um, one of the things is a deep uh, involvement and interest in retrofit, especially in deep retrofit. Um, Carbon Corp spawned a new sister cooperative, People Powered Retrofit, which is a one-stop shop for retrofit. And we're also carrying on delivering retrofit projects ourselves, an area-based scheme here in Manchester. So we're really interested in retrofit, and really interested in understanding uh, the impact that those energy efficiency measures has in a home, particularly in terms of carbon saving, but also in other, other kind of respects in terms of bills and energy and all that sort of thing. Carbon Corp also has an energy systems team and that dates back many years now as well. We have a maker space called Eco Home Lab, uh, which is particularly around uh, the deployment of open innovation in the home, open source tech and open source um, uh, hardware and software, which I would, uh, if you're interested, you can check that out. And um, we also run a number of energy system projects, innovation projects, 
In particular, the, with the use of smart meter data, we run a service called PowerShaper Monitor, where people can interact directly with their, their smart meter data and download that as well. And we, we also have developed systems and processes that support local flexibility uh, or uh, home flexibility within the home that can adapt to uh, the demands of, of uh, local flexibility requirements. And um, we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that as we go on. So the quantification problem, what is it? Well, first and foremost, uh, we, we have a huge issue here in the UK. Well, it's not just in the UK. Um, we are absolutely committed to the idea of um, retrofit, energy efficiency, um, implementing measures in the home, insulation, um, and, and other related measures that will reduce energy demand because we know that's, a, that's really important uh, in terms of tackling climate change, in terms of reducing bills on a permanent basis for householders and tackling uh, kind of related issues around health in the home and also like the skills, skills need in the UK. And, you know, for all sorts of reasons, retrofit's fantastic. Um, and there are programmes, there should be more programmes, absolutely, but there are programmes in the UK that um, fund many billions of pounds worth of measures over this parliament at least, and hopefully many billions more in the future. Now, we have a challenge and that is that we're not able to effectively quantify the impact of those measures and then many billions of pounds worth of investment. We're not able to effectively um, to, to quantify the impact that's happening. What happens mostly on uh, public schemes and, and often in, on non-public schemes is um, a, a design is, 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 is carried out for the, for the delivery of retrofit interventions. The interventions are carried out and there is a certain amount of guesswork that goes on around how successful those interventions have been. Often there will be modeling involved. Um, for example, we, we deployed these kind of measures. We think that they should save about this amount of energy. We know that from past schemes and also from um, kind of uh, lab based or, you know, uh, design, <clears throat> um, sorry, experimental kind of research and that sort of thing. So we, we assume we will we'll save this amount of energy. Um, and, and we call that deeming, that we're deemed that these, these programs will have saved that amount of energy. There is a, a well-known and well-described issue there. And if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, you can see that this is one of the best um, evaluated programs in the UK, now 10 years old, uh, Retrofit for the Future. And the design target there was an 80% reduction. Uh, you can see the thick black line, 80% reduction in energy use. You can see all the bars that are above that line uh, represent something called the performance gap. So the actual performance uh, of those properties was above, uh, for, for most of those properties, not all, was above the 80% the reduction. So we may deem, we may model, but we also know that reality is messy and, and, uh, and our estimations may not be, be, be uh, correct. So there's a real issue there about, are we getting value for money? There are related issues here as well, not just on retrofit, um, and indeed a fantastic bit of research uh, a report by the Green Finance Institute. Um, they have a particular mind on banks and other financial intermediaries that are lending for retrofit. And a real barrier there, again, it's, it's the quantification problem. If you don't know um, the impact, the measures that you are funding will have, um, it becomes harder to price the risk of that lending. And, um, and that leads to barriers to lending and problems with interest rates and that sort of thing. And secondly, uh, slightly adjacent, is distribution network operators, the people that feed electricity from the big pylons down to people's front doors, to their meters. Um, there are increasing pressures there around the grid and the energy use and demand on the grid. And there are zones now of stress, um, uh, different areas over different periods of time as well. And um, this is leading them to procure what they call flexibility. So the ability to perhaps avoid energy use at certain times in certain places. Obviously, we see national schemes this winter. This is on a very local level. And there will, there, there will be payment or there is payment offered for those. 
Um, again, they're, they're procuring essentially energy efficiency interventions, either on a permanent or a kind of time limited basis. How can they be demonstrated to have an impact? This is around quantification again. So we have a gap in our knowledge and we have part of the answer in, in this innovation. Uh, oh, James, you were going to mention in particular paid per performance and metered energy savings. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, Jonathan. So yeah, very briefly, um, just to outline where this has um, where this has been delivered in practice so far. So um, metered savings, uh, as Jonathan outlined, um, this problem of uh, quantifying the savings from uh, from energy efficiency interventions uh, by essentially subtracting reported like actual consumption after a retrofit from the counterfactual um, has been used to has has been used to underpin um, has been used to underpin retrofit financing programs in the private sector um, in several different schemes around the world. Generally, those schemes tend to come under the banner of pay for what's known as pay for performance, whereby, well, it's exactly what it sounds like, but uh, essentially an aggregator or a, an energy services company, an ESCO, will buy, uh, will sell aggregated savings um, from a portfolio of properties um, that have been retrofitted under, you know, a, 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 under a scheme um, to typically investors and financial institutions with long term time horizons um, so that they can generate returns on the basis of um, on the basis of payback payback times um, through through retrofits. Now, um, if you can just click to the next slide, Jonathan. Okay, yeah. So, um, so we've had so um, there are about eleven pay for performance schemes that have been operating globally, and typically most of those um, focus on the commercial sector. But obviously, Carbon Carb we focus mainly on the residential sector helping um, helping homeowners in the UK mainly to decarbonize uh, their homes and reduce their emissions. Um, there's only one live uh, live residential pay for performance program. And that's, next slide please, uh, that's operating uh, in uh, California in the US. Um, and that's the Pacific Gas and Electric Company's residential pay for performance program. Um, so we've mainly been uh, looking at that program and kind of engaging with some of the stakeholders through this project um, to think about how we can replicate uh, use use the, uh, the 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 meter saving software that we've been looking at to replicate a scheme like that in the UK. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, creating a counterfactual. Um, if we can just jump to the next slide again, sorry. Um, <clears throat> we've been looking specifically at the software that was used in that uh, that residential pay for performance program over in California. Um, uh, and that software is known as Caltrack. Um, so it's a set of methods known as the Caltrack methods. Um, uh, there is a, it's an open source standard, um, so you can download uh, all of the software that you might use to build that counterfactual uh, from GitHub. Um, and typically, the way that it works, it's exactly it's exactly what it looks like here. So you've got um, a counterfactual after a retrofit is uh, is implemented and reported consumption, and typically, obviously, that reported consumption will be lower. Than the counterfactual, at least you'd hope, after after a uh, after retrofit's been implemented. Next slide, please. Um, and typically, the way that Caltrack uh, as a software works is um, it com it comprises two uh, two of these open source packages, um, one EE Weather and one EE Meter. The EE standing for Energy Efficiency, um, and EE Weather enable. Uh, well, EE meter is is essentially that ca that counterfactual generation software. Um, so it, it's actually re it's relatively uh, the intuition behind it is relatively simple. It basically takes um, um, comes up with a statistical regression um, regressing external temperature data against um, smart metered energy consumption data, um, and it essentially analyzes how responsive is energy consumption to external temperature data. And the the the, the theory, you know, the, the real benefit to that being everybody or, you know, increasingly large amounts of people have smart meters in their homes. Um, uh, and, and we can get uh, external temperature data from satellite sources or weather stations. Um, so there's a real there's a real potential benefit to scalability here in terms of in terms of uh, building that counterfactual and and rolling out kind of metered saving solutions. Um, so EE meter, e meter takes those two parameters, uh, um, uh, external temperature data and um, uh, energy consumption data, <clears throat> and it uses that to create a counterfactual. EE weather 
um, take is, is essentially as a tool that allows you to download that external temperature data um, by simply providing a site specifier, typically in terms of latitude and longitude, and then it'll very quickly download half hourly um, temperature data uh, for any sites uh, currently. Well, well, we'll see currently in the US and Australia. So next slide, please. So yeah, the way that this works typically in the US, uh, well, it works, but in the UK, because it, it, it uh, only allows for downloading uh, weather data in the US and Australia. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, uh, next slide, please. And it also only allows for you to, um, uh, it, it only allows for um, energy uh, temperature data to be calibrated to Fahrenheit data only. So that presents some uh, quite significant issues for operation of the uh, Caltrack methods and, and these two software packages outside of the US. Um, so what we've done in this project is, uh, next slide, please. Um, we've uh, included a, um, we've included uh, an application programming interface to the Copernicus program, um, which essentially allows you to download weather data for anywhere in the world. So it's not just outside of the US that we've got this to work, um, but it's, uh, and, and sorry, not just outside of the US, like the UK that we've got this to work, but um, anywhere in the world, as I say, you can now download, um, you can use EE Weather um, through our amendments, which are on GitHub, to download any um, weather data for anywhere in the world. And then secondly, the um, the uh, second amendment that we've included in EE Meter um, is to include a, um, a temperature toggle. So we can uh, very easily switch between uh, both uh, degrees C and degrees Fahrenheit um, to make sure that this works. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so, so now effectively, um, the, Cal the Caltrack methods and uh, the uh, both of these EE meter and EE weather packages can operate outside of um, outside of the US um, and and be used to underpin um, meter savings analysis, um, as I say, anywhere in the world. Um, the uh, and the benefit to this is uh, is is quite significant. So if we just um, jump forward a slide, please. So when you're under when you're using the Caltrack to undertake metered savings analysis, i.e., you know, constructing that counterfactual, um, initially, uh, you essentially just get a constant counterfactual um, uh, arising from some issues. Known, well, what's an issue known as a base load only selection model? Um, now that essentially co corresponds to an average of the previous year's consumption. It's not dynamic. It actually is is almost totally meaningless if you wanted to um, if you wanted to evaluate on a dynamic basis how much am I saving per hour or per day um, as a result of this retrofit and how, you know, and therefore how can I um, link this to, um, link this to lending, link this to financing. Um, but now next slide, please. Um, yeah, it's, it's exactly what it should look like. So we, we've been able to um, amend the model so that actually for the, for analysis in the UK, um, it generates, um, yeah, as I say, dynamic uh, counterfactual estimates um, able to link into the Caltrack pay for performance standard um, and really like help us to start to try and replicate some of those exciting pay for performance schemes that we've seen operating over in the US. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think the the other, th the other thing to, to emphasize is that we've really engaged throughout, um, throughout this whole process with the open source community. As I mentioned, Caltrack is an open source standard. Um, and uh, it was initially developed by a company named Recurve. Um, so Recurve was very much involved with that um, that pay for performance program over in California that I mentioned um, at the beginning. And uh, <clears throat> uh, and um, they maintain the repositories online, and we've very much pushed push these amendments back so that uh, so that we can that we can incorporate regions outside of the US in the uh, in the Caltrack standard. Um, and you can see those you can see those. Uh, those on GitHub, next slide, please, uh, through two pull requests that we've made. Um, and I'd be happy to share the, um, I'd be happy to, very happy to share the links to those um, if anybody interested in the detail um, after this webinar. Um, yeah, uh, just to answer a couple of questions that have come in the chat. So is that graph in relation to a single house? Um, Yes, that is um, that is in relation to a single house. But yeah, just to be, just to be clear, this is cumulative energy consumption. So um, yeah. I mean, in, in, in this in this one, you can see that uh, cumulative energy consumption tends to, uh, the rate of increase in uh, energy consumption tends to decrease over the summer. And then obviously, as you come into the winter months, um, uh, the, and, and the rate of increase in energy consumption steeply increases. 
Um, but nevertheless, uh, the, the, the point being that the uh, reported consumption is typically lower than the counterfactual. Um, uh, so if we can just jump to the next uh, section. Um, yeah, so uh, in addition to this kind of open source engagement and data analysis piece that we've been working on, uh, we've also developed a front end web solution for um, uh, for implementing the Caltrack methods. So one of the really big issues with 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 Caltrack and with EE meter is that it does require some level of um, some level of coding experience to to run. Um, and not, obviously not everybody has the time to um, go and learn Python. So what we've done is we've essentially packaged all of this all of this work into um, an easy to use accessible front end web app. So um, if you can just jump onto the next slide. Um, and uh, do you uh, need me to uh, stop sharing? <coughs> yeah, I, uh, you can sh stop sharing and then I'll I'll reshare and then I can give us a quick demo of the um, of the web app that we've been that we've been developing. Okay. Great. Can you see? Looks good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, essentially this this uh, is well it's brought it's uh, under the it's been brought under the branding of one of our existing services, which is known as PowerShaper Monitor. Um, but the broad PowerShaper branding is basically for anybody who's interested in um, harness, yeah, harnessing the power of their smart meter data and, and uh, learning more about their energy consumption. Um, uh, and yeah, so this is so this is named PowerShaper Tracker, um, basically for the reason that we can bring it under under that branding. Um, and as I say, this very much enables you to under, undertake Caltrack compliant uh, and metered savings analysis um, for uh, at the moment any building in the UK. So what you can do is you can upload your smart meter data. Um, if you've undertaken a retrofit, you've, you can upload your smart meter data along with details of the retrofit. Um, like you know what date uh, what dates did you undertake the retrofit? Um, you don't need to provide any details of like spe like specific materials that we used or design considerations. Um, you just need to provide the smart meter data and the dates of the retrofit. Um, and if I mean, we we also allow for a additional uh, parameters like um, floor area if you want to um, calculate energy use intensity as well. Um, but uh, just to give you a very quick walkthrough of, of how this works. So um, you can either analyze um, uh, you can either analyze uh, consumption data from uh, a single property, um, so you know your own home, or a portfolio of properties. And typically, I guess the portfolio of property, um, uh, the, port the portfolio option would typically apply to like public sector um, procurement options. So, for example, through social housing decarbonization fund. Um, and you can also upload your own uh, smart meter data in CSV format, or you can connect it to our existing PowerShaper monitor service, which is basically a kind of cloud hosting, um, a cloud uh, data hosting service where you can um, you can store your smart meter data. And um, uh, I'm sure uh, Jonathan and Jonathan can ask, um, answer questions about that um, later on if if uh, anybody does have any questions. Um, you'd also. I'd, uh, you'd also just confirm whether or not you want both gas and electricity analyzing because um, both have both both parameters have different sensitivities to um, to external temperature data. I mean, it depends whether or not you use gas or electricity to heat your home, basically. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just to give you a quick demo of uh, yeah, so you'd upload your CSVs um, in this in this instance, I'd, you know, just choosing both gas and electricity. Um, uh, You'd select. You'd you proceed with selecting that, and then uh, uh, in a second, yeah. So then you'd provide your postcode so that you, we can we can specify um, the wet local weather in the region. Um, uh, a reference, like if you wanted to, um, uh, for for uh, referencing uh, later down the line, like basically it's just a job number, um, floor area as I mentioned, and then intervention start date, intervention end date, and. Um, and yeah, and here's and I guess here's one I prepared earlier. Um, we uh, you 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 know you specify all of those things, and then you, then you uh, the output is this this kind of meter you know all of the results from your meter savings, uh, Caltrack compliant meter savings piece. So um, so yeah, if this is all after your immediate retrofit, um, you have um, on a month. Yeah, well, you can change how you want to present it, but uh, in in this in this case, it's through the year. Um, 
you have counterfactual usage, observed usage, um, and and the meter savings um, on a point like on, in in real time um, over on in this case the past two years. Um, you can change how you want to present it. So at the moment this is real time, but you can also um, compare on a cumulative basis, um, just like those graphs that I showed you um, before. Um, there are also two types of Caltrack models, so either the hourly model or the daily model. So you can switch between those. Um, the the web app will give you uh, will give you estimates of how much carbon you've saved over a certain period. Um, so certainly, definitely for um, for local authorities who are um, who are um, motivated by carbon savings. So obviously, a lot of local authorities are, are, are held by uh, specific carbon reduction targets. Um, so this is this is really really useful for them. Um, we've linked this to the uh, the ONS Grid Carbon Intensity database um, to provide these figures. Um, it'll give you uncertainty metrics. So for anybody involved in um, uh, Caltrack type analysis through um, often what's known as measurement and verification, um, these are the kind of uncertainty metrics that you'd need for um, uh, to to, to uh, essentially qualify any of the any of the uh, the, the outputs of your analysis, um, and it'll also give you a kind of comparison of like where you typically sit in terms of um, like the uh, the carbon intensity of uh, your, your your local area. Um, you can and, and just to finally say you can also download the uh, the, the the raw the raw outputs of the of the job as well um, if you wanted to undertake further analysis on that data. Um, just through these two links here. Um, and uh, with that, um, I don't know whether I should take some questions on that now or whether- Yeah, we should... James, what, yeah. I, what I think actually, well, I'll, I'll talk about the exploitation of the policy, but I think just now, because a lot of chat um, things, I think you should highlight some of the um, kind of limitations, maybe in terms of like the technology readiness of this tool, where we're at, within its technology, like how close to market it is. And also maybe some of the, um, some of the things it can't do around like uh, changes to occupancy and also uh, changes like large scale changes like EVs and what have you, just to caveat all those things. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, so I think, the the first thing to emphasize is that um, Caltrack as a standard is is generally used on portfolios. So um, individual at the individual home level, um, there are issues there, there are well documented issues with accuracy in terms of generating um, counterfactuals. So um, and, and as I say, like this is very much an implementation of the existing standards. Um, so I, I this this particular web app is. Will be most successful at the portfolio level, um, and the reason for that is is because uh, because we're only really monitoring uh, because we're only really asking for um, energy consumption data and external temperature data. We're not um, you, you're not really necessarily able to account for some of those uh, more complex those more complex um, uh, parameters affecting energy consumption. So, um, occupancy, for example. Um, there are massive data privacy issues with monitoring occupancy of um, of uh, people in their homes, um, and you know we very much didn't want to go down that uh, down that route. Um, so the way that uh, the the software accounts for that is it constructs a proxy um, for occupancy, but um, it's not always necessarily um, it's not always necessarily accurate at the portfolio level. Occupancy variance in occupancy tends to average out, um, which is why it's more accurate at that level. Um, so. And things like EVs and PVs require submetering and will require a kind of yeah more innovation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is this is just at the the sort of central meter level, I suppose. So you, you know, it assumes that. I mean, one of the central assumptions here is that you don't actually you're just consuming, you're not producing. Um, so. Uh, yeah, certainly for uh, on-site renewables is definitely an area for development within the within the Caltrack community, um, yeah. but but it's not accounted for yet. So so for clarity, because uh, I know what people see a really nice web tool and they think, wow, this is like ready to go and everything. So this is an innovation project, and this is the product of that innovation project, and there will be further innovation projects um, that go ahead of this, and and it is also. Um, 
the whole point of this project is that it's open innovation, it's open standards, it's interrogable. So it's also, um, if you like, a gift to the community here who want to use and develop these kind of approaches as well, can take learning from this, can propose amendments and all that sort of thing. So um, on that technology readiness kind of scale, don't see this as the end product. See this as like an intermediary that goes on the basis of pre-existing innovation and points forward to, to new. But in the in in the context of pointing forward, James, do you want to stop sharing and I'll I'll talk about exploitation and, and new new potential um, applications. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. And I, yeah, I would just I would just say um, sure. yeah. just for, just slightly further to that as well. Um, obviously, we're kind of uh, with this project. We've been um, sort of pushing you know pushing forwards on the on the technical front on the front technical front. But but yeah, I mean this has to be the part. This has to be underpinned by standards in the UK, and we don't yet have the standards um, to build confidence in the markets around something like this. Um, so. Yeah, it, it's it, until those come along, then you know this is not something that can be used to support lending um, on uh, on on retrofit projects unless your unless your appetite for risk is extremely healthy. <laughs> so yeah, let, let's talk about that exactly. Let's talk about potential applications. Um, as I said, this is part of like further innovation. Um, there is oh, and I should highlight that um, in the delivery of this project, we we're really assisted by Energy Systems Catapult, whose support came as part of the of the of the Innovate UK support. Um, but it was super valuable um, research uh, that they did in this sector. Um, and yeah, also to highlight that my colleague uh, Helen Grimshaw led a lot of this work. Um, she's on site in London on an evaluation following up on retrofit for the future 10 years on uh, so she can't be here today but um, she's done a lot of this work so in terms of business cases I kind of highlighted them at the beginning uh, pointing a way forward but we have some broad areas distribution network operator those, those people taking the power from the from the um, uh, pylons down to the to the house level, um, they've got lots and lots of use cases in this area. Um, there is the retrofit evaluator. So, and I know there's some people on the call here who are really interested in that. How can we evidence what's happened? And as James has highlighted, publicly procured schemes, which are portfolios, um, most notably social housing decarbonisation fund, which is common intervention measures across dozens of houses um, have the best use case for this in that kind of context. And then also kind of local authorities evidencing carbon, emi uh, carbon emission reductions as a, as a result of activity, not just in social housing, but a bit broader as well. And then there is a use case around owner occupiers, which we'll talk a little bit about. In terms of the DNO, and again, we're really grateful to Systems Catapult for this work. Uh, they did interviewing DNOs and also uh, housing providers. So, um, so DNOs are looking to procure energy efficiency as an alternative to reinforcing substations. Substations cost a lot of money uh, to reinforce. Uh, they do so to account for exist for demand uh, expansion on, on that network or constraints in different ways. Uh, they call them constraint management zones. Is the is the jargon there? And the, I think I think the, 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 there has been a relatively recent redefinition of the tools that they can deploy their flexible kind of assets. And energy efficiency is uh, kind of slightly counterintuitively deemed to be a, a flexible asset. Um, so local, uh, sorry, uh, distribution network operators are now willing to pay for um, those kind of measures. Um, I think what we've kind of um, uh, got from this project is that um, the value of the flexibility, i.e. the cost of that substation, like um, uh, in terms of the value of the energy efficiency to, to reducing the need to improve that, is not at a level that can pay for the cost of the measures, the full cost of the measures. It may be 10%, it may be 15%. So it may be that we, we would really benefit from houses in this area being lower energy demand. So perhaps they can get heat pumps in, 
So they lower the energy demand in terms of insulation. The heat pumps then don't use quite as much energy, but the amount that that value is for the DNO is less than the cost of the insulation. So it needs to be stacked in some sense. But so in terms of like a market based approach, it doesn't quite work yet uh, or necessarily in the way that we might want it to. Uh, DNOs um, have highlighted, though, that this kind of approach is really important in helping them understand which measures would work in that kind of context and to be able to quantify the impact of those measures. As we, as we said, really, if you're wanting to deploy stuff very strategically, um, location and time, you need to have that, that quantification. So this kind of tool would enable that portfolio approach and look at that. One thing some DNOs have expressed an interest in is being able to deploy area-based schemes. So there might be an insulation scheme down your street um, covering all properties, and that would be funded by the distribution network operator. And that, that's the dream, but um, a lot of them say they're not really there yet, and, and the regulatory environment doesn't really either allow or encourage that. So it's not really there at the moment. One thing this can do is help the network have more visibility and understand the network better and understand what's happening on the network. They also have social and fuel poverty obligations in terms that the government places upon them to advise householders. And again, this kind of tool can help them better advise people uh, and better advise what kind of things would work in their area. So that's the DNO kind of context. And there's clearly some interesting way to go there public schemes, retrofit schemes, social housing decarbonisation fund, the local authority, um, green homes grant scheme, um, and other things like home upgrade grant. These all have a real need for quantification. And um, the, especially the housing providers at the moment, they, they have a real issue with data and understanding what's happening within the housing, within the houses that they manage and operate. Um, EPCs are kind of the, the, the kind of only tool they have and a very crude tool uh, and often inaccurate. So they often lack the accuracy and understanding what's going on in properties. And they often end up paying consultants quite a lot of money in order to kind of uh, bridge that gap. A big driver at the moment is also around air quality rather than, than necessarily carbon saving at the moment because of some well-publicized um, public health impacts of like poor ventilation. The social housing decarbonisation uh, fund is complex and not unproblematic. And a lot of, or 50% of the people we talk to, providers are not engaged in that and see their role as a more stepwise, long-term improvement of their housing stock rather than a big bang. So what their interest was, was in creating a data warehouse of good information that could evidence the impact of specific measures that they might then solid wall insulation, for example, or triple glazed windows, that they might then use that data to fill the gaps that they have to better deploy them as part of ongoing schemes. There's obviously a link here to the building energy passports agenda, um, i.e. there's a logbook, a digital logbook attached to each property, that's quite a high level policy ambition at the moment. There's a lack of detail there, but you could see how a data warehouse would work well with that. And as I said before, there's also a lot of interest in quantifying local authority impacts. In terms of owner occupiers and one-stop shops, people like um, uh, People Powered Retrofit, for example, we're not there yet. You know, Some of the things that James mentioned around occupancy, around um, uh, inaccuracies around a single property rather than, than several properties mean that there isn't a deployable tool here and now. Although we have learned a lot about what householders want from um, uh, understanding and evaluating the retrofits that they procure. Having said that, there is the building renovation passport agenda, which is moving slowly forward and has advocates like the Green Finance Institute. And there are things like the Green Homes Finance Accelerator, you'll be hearing a lot more about in the coming months around investment, uh, lending. And again, this is a driver that continues to be there. So further innovation is needed, but there is certainly demand and certainly an opportunity. 
And very lastly, in terms of, so I can finish up for questions because I want a decent time, policy, what's happening at the moment, Ofgem and Beers have been part of our engagement here, part of the advisory group. And so we've, we've gained some interesting insights from them, trying to see, to read the tea leaves about where things are coming. Mandation uh, is not a word that the regulators necessarily want to hear at the moment. They prefer to think about uh, reform of markets and what drivers and incentives there are um, to tailor this kind of thing. So maybe some of us would, would advocate for mandation as a kind of, this is the approach. Um, but yeah, for now it's about markets and about how markets can be tailored to, yeah, to create these drivers, to ensure that kind of meat and energy savings is part of that process and to avoid unintended consequences. There is um, quite a lot going on in this space around market reform. And, and I'm sure people on the call or, or watching this will um, have been potentially involved in different consultations, more of an emphasis on locational and temporal pricing. So pricing that reflects uh, localized constraints and the need for demand shifting and different things. So. It's interesting, but it's in process. And I think this can contribute to that debate. Um, there's a question about programs, uh, publicly, uh, public investment in retrofit. Um, certainly um, in the public, so that would be kind of social housing and perhaps less able to pay people. There are schemes and there are billions of pounds that are going into schemes. What the future of those will be, we're not sure. There's a signal that they will continue but at a similar level. Social housing decarbonisation fund has not been without its problems, um, but fundamentally we advocate for public investment in retrofit. And at the moment, we're not seeing private support of private owner occupiers on any scale, but there's, there's a hope that there'll be more of that. If there is more money that comes in, there is increasing drive for quantification. And finally, James mentioned standards. We have PAS 2035, which is the process standard for retrofit. Um, and allied with that is something called the Trustmark Data Warehouse and building renovation passports match with that as well. That kind of policy uh, constellation is not really working at its best, let's say. The PAS 2035 is very light on requirements around evaluation. The Trustmark Data Warehouse is not really fit for purpose at the moment. It could be, it could develop into something that is. And building renovation passports are very high level. So we have the bits there, but they need to come together. And as, as kind of referred to earlier, air quality is a real driver, internal air quality, uh, damp and mold and that sort of thing. And um, uh, what we'd want to see is like a synthesis between that kind of thing and energy and uh, smart meters and other kind of environmental data collection, because there is definitely complementarity there. Um, it's whether it can be brought together. OK, just before we have Q&A, um, more information. If you're interested in things like PowerShip and Monitor, there's a, there's a website to go to get immediate information. If you're interested in the project, in collaboration, in testing, and that sort of thing, drop us an email. Claire and Matt are the people to talk to. And we will be able to make PowerShare Petraka available. It's just sort of a staging site at the moment, as with all the caveats that it's a innovation tool and for testing, but we'll be making that available um, in the next few weeks. So yes, we can move on to um, question and answers, which I, I believe we've got Claire who'll be teeing stuff up for us. Is that correct, Claire? Hi, yeah, I've been um, monitoring the chat. So um, there's a few different themes that have come through. So um, I'll just start with one, first of all, um, as a few people have asked this first question. Um, so this is about how the tool copes with switching from gas or even oil um, heating um, to, to air source heat pumps and how does the counterfactual account for this? Um, so I've been, uh, yeah, I've, I've been, uh, I've, I've clocked a few of these in the chat and I've uh, tried to respond as best I can, but um, I think this is a fantastic question. Um, and I'd say in theory, yes, it can account for it. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily 
I would I I wouldn't necessarily back the results. Um, uh, yeah, back the results uh, with with 100% conviction. And again, you know, this is just a caveat that this is an emerging technology, um, and a lot you know a lot of these use cases haven't necessarily yet been tested. So what you, the way that you, I guess you would you would typically do it is um, in training the model because you're accounting for both um, because but because both are both you know both gas and uh, electricity with heat pumps are. Um, and, and oil are responsive to changes in temperature, then that relationship is still there. Um, not, however, obviously, given the fact that load curves um, for uh, heat pumps are, are necessarily different to load curves for gas and oil, like that relationship is going to be changed slightly. Um, so the 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 you know the fundamental the underlying model that's built during the training period isn't necessarily going to account for isn't necessarily going to precisely model that relationship um uh, between you know it, the, the relationship between gas and oil and external temperature and um and electricity isn't necessarily going to be exactly the same so as i say you could generate outputs with uh you know you could generate outputs um uh a counterfactual output with uh, when you're when you're doing fuel switching but um but you know i would just caveat it by saying you know that it's, it wouldn't I wouldn't 100 back it and I think mm. that there's definitely a lot more testing that needs to be done on this um typically this model is is used to evaluate um fabric efficiency upgrades so mm. you know mm. uh, glazing external wall insulation that sort of thing right thanks James um so another the theme which has arisen from from a few different people in the chat and the questions is um how the CO2 savings, um, how that works. Um, does it take into account uh, grid decarbonisation? Um, is this half hourly? Um, is it based on location? Could you explain a bit how, how that's presented? Um, yeah, so it so it's not it's not half hourly. It does account for long term grid decarbonisation, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, these are these are pretty generic um carbon figures basically so it's taken from um uh it, it, it's the average figure carbon intent for carbon intensity specified in the 2021 standard assessment procedure um so you know those will change but um but yeah certainly not on a half hourly basis so it's, gen it's generally intended to give um an estimate you know a kind of sap compliance i suppose estimate of of uh, of carbon intensity but it's certainly not 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 dynamic um that potentially will change um there's a lot of um there's a lot of data coming through on um uh tariff level carbon intensity um and obviously i kind of ideally i think in the future we'd like to re incorporate that as well thanks james um uh, and another question which is specifically about the application and um, how, how it can function in terms of its the retrofit dates um, currently, it's got uh, start and an end date for a single retrofit measure. Um, are there plans to increase this? Could because obviously a lot of retrofits are kind of incremental; they take various stages. Um, how how could the tool handle that potentially in the future? So the the tool needs uh, at least a whole year of like stable uh, data to 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 build a model of yeah to build to build that model of. Um, uh, of behavior on um so if you know it, it, you you could you could you sort of could do that um if you're you know if you're if you're undertaking retrofits at uh i'd say um a minimum frequency of 13 months because you'd need you need a year's worth of data and then if you wanted to generate if you wanted like a, you know a meaningful period of uh of, uh, of, of 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 kind of savings to analyze you know typically you know that might be a month but obviously you know you want you do want longer um so yeah I, it, it would just depend on the frequency of you know how how often are you are you um implementing energy efficiency improvements um generally speaking i suppose if it you know if if it if the frequencies are less you know le if frequencies are, are greater than you know once a year then it would you you'd essentially just have to start you know end your um, training period on the model at like the, f the date the first energy efficiency improvement was started to be implemented, and then you have what's called a blackout date, 
um, which is exactly what it sounds like, um, you know, kind of just just um, while works are ongoing. So you you, you start it um, when the first works started, and then you the blackout day would end when the last works ended, um, and then you know, and then you'd be able to compare kind of you know uh, training period data with with uh, with test period data after the retrofit. But um, yeah. So, so in a way, yes, but but um, because of, because of the limitations around, you basically have to have a kind of um, have a comparator date for every day in the year that maps onto um, maps onto a date in the test period, right? Um, so if you don't have that, then you can't then you can't build a meaningful model. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, so it's interesting, like sort of blackout period. That's that's a good term for it. Um, so um, I think this is probably a question for Jonathan. And um, so this is about the kind of demand side response um, and DNO um, connections. So could the counterfactual methodology be used for DSR program baselining? And uh, just leading on from that as well, um, you mentioned that um, DNO DNOs might be covering costs. Um, so up to ten to fifteen percent. So what would that look like? for turtles per home? Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll take that one first. Um, so yeah, we, we have more and more, there are more and more uh, local flexibility tenders um, available now. And uh, Electricity Northwest launched their latest one a few days ago. Um, the Piclo um, flexibility platform is a good place um, to see these tenders. The um, amounts of money vary by location and by time as well. And, and different flexibility calls in different places have different amounts of money involved, different kind of requirements in terms of turn down uh, and, and all that sort of thing. The, the Electricity Northwest one um, specifically kind of references energy efficiency, demand reduction as part of that. So what they'll likely be looking for is like, permanent demand reduction within an area associated with an intervention and evidence through smart meter data to some degree or another. Um, what that might look like from a community energy organization's point of view or any organization working on a, on a geographical, local geographical basis, it may mean um, I mean, lots of door knocking and say, you know, we can we can fund energy efficiency measures in your area or um, or potentially an area based scheme, which is what Carbon Corp is doing at the moment, where we offer a certain number of measures like a blanket offer. Now, because the value is less than the measure, then you're not talking about um, door knocking, say we can offer you free insulation. But what you may be doing is saying we can offer you discount insulation, uh, this amount, you know, uh, of discount. Um, it may be that that you can stack that um, that income with another thing. So, for example, if you're a local authority and you're able to offer a local authority scheme in a certain area, and you're bringing in funding from government, let's say, it may be that you can top that up with some more money. Now. I have to say, like the energy efficiency piece for flexibility markets is is kind of is very new and evolving. So um, don't take my word for it. You can just walk in, walk onto a Piclo and do that. But I think it offers these opportunities, and the and DNOs are totally up for discussing them as well. Um, and yeah, I, I believe it does. I do you know flexibility? Uh, it's more your thing, Claire. That like uh, the um, demand side response programs you're doing. I mean, I would assume it would offer a good baselining thing. The, the DNOs we talked to weren't super keen. I think it's because there's a high level of mandation from government around how that should be done, but I, I don't know actually. <laughs> Maybe Claire or James could say. I think it can offer a good uh, baseline for DNOs. Um, the key thing uh, is the aggregation. So um, how do you then aggregate your portfolio of uh, flexibility providers? Um, and the, the key there, as I mentioned, Jonathan, is 
uh, these, especially in like Pickford Select, it's heavily based on location. So if there would be a way to then define a specific location um, as your portfolio, essentially, then yeah, there could be applications for this for calculating baseline, I think. Um, yeah. Obviously just looking at electricity um, in that sense, but yeah. Sorry, James. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, really the, I guess like the main application of 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 um, Caltrack um, in a commercial setting outside of the um, residential paper performance program that I mentioned before is 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 in evaluating DSR. Um, it's not used at the individual household level, but definitely in, in portfolios, it's been used to evaluate DSR events um, in in collaboration with with the local DNOs in California. So yes, um, but uh, yeah. I, I think there is, there's definitely still a bit of work to be done around um, demonstrating that, to be honest, it's like it, it, it's superior to um, existing DSR evaluation methods. I mean, is it better than just comparing savings, um, you know, hour, hourly savings achieved through DSR compared to yesterday's consumption? Um, and, you know, it's definitely it's definitely an open question and, and it's not one that we um, not one that we've been able to conclude during this piece. But hopefully, obviously, as research continues, then then maybe. I think we've come to the end of our time, sadly. It's been a super interesting webinar. There's been loads and loads of chat, loads of questions there. We've tried to answer some, but um, obviously we'll come back to that. We are about to start a new project. I believe it's still embargoed, so you'll have to watch this space. But yes, this is definitely not the end of this work. And a number of the people we've mentioned in this webinar will be part of that partnership. So do yeah, keep in touch, keep uh, uh, watch this space. We have your emails. So we'll, what we'll do is make this uh, recording publicly available on our website and the presentation as well. And we'll email that out to everyone when we've done that. Uh, but yeah, another, a big thanks, big thanks to James and Claire and everyone for coming. And yeah, we'll be, we'll be in touch. So, uh, see you soon.